Good morning. Uh, we are going to spend the next hour talking about history. Yeah, you can leave now, but you'll regret it if you do. When past performance is a guide, using history to make sense of the post-crisis world, we have a star-studded uh, panel this afternoon. I'm going to make the introductions very brief uh, indeed in order to maximize the discussion time. Sitting to my uh, far right, he doesn't usually sit to my right, at least ideologically, uh, Dan Arbus, uh, founder uh, of Zirion, the hedge fund, which is now part of uh, Perella Weinberg, of which he's a partner. Next to him, uh, all the way from uh, London, England, as they say here, uh, is Ben Funnell, chief equity strategist at uh, the GLG hedge fund, now part of uh, Man Group. On my left, uh, Mitch Julis, uh, co-founder, co-president, and co-chief executive of Canyon Partners, the LA-based uh, fund. And last, but by no means least, uh, on my uh, extreme left, Peter Thiel, co-founder of PayPal, president of Clarium Capital, managing partner of the Founders Fund. And Peter, I'm going to start with, if, you, uh, if I may, uh, people think of you as a, a future-minded person, uh, a supremo uh, of the tech sector. Does history play a part in the way that you think about investment decisions? Well, it, when one ends up thinking about it a tremendous amount, you always think, uh, is this like the 1970s? Is it like the 1930s? How, you know, what are the ways in which uh, our time is similar to and uh, different uh, from the past? Um, in, in science and technology, I think, every moment in history happens only once. And there's sort of a miraculous or singular moment when something new is discovered. And so, uh, so there is something about science and technology that certainly is very um, anti-historical. Uh, but I, I, think, uh, I think that is a useful way to think about this uh, question about how things are similar to or different from the 30s, which I think is the central question that people ask with respect to the crisis uh, or the post-crisis world we find ourselves in. And from a scientific technological perspective, the 30s were a phenomenal decade. There was a tremendous amount that was invented. Uh, you had the uh, secondary oil recovery industry took off. You had the plastics industry, the aerospace industry, the movie industry. Um, uh, you know, um, household appliances uh, were really uh, developed uh, during the, the 30s. And, um, and in a context of tremendous technological progress, it turns out that you can print money and not have inflation, and it, money grows on trees. And, uh, and, uh, and there was a bad austerity in the early part of the 30s, but from 33 onwards, the United States engaged in this extraordinary um, money printing experiment. Uh, gold, you know, dollar was effectively devalued by almost 50% if you look at it in gold terms. And uh, there was the critique of the New Deal was always, this was gonna end in disastrous inflation, and the inflation never really showed up. Um, because there was enough of a technological tailwind uh, which could power many ideas that might have been delusional, might have been mistaken, but it didn't matter how right or wrong they were because um, there was enough science and technology to, uh, to push them forwards. And so when, when, uh, when I think about the, the present, I wonder if we have the same amount of a technological tailwind um, to overcome the money printing that is going on by Bernanke and um, that at, at this point the rest of the world is, is emulating. Um, I've argued in many contexts that I think there's not as much technology happening as possible, and this is sort of a key way that uh, the current uh, uh, decade differs from the past. Um, but let me just uh, focus on one specific um, area of technology other than the IT sector, which people always focus on, and, uh, and that is a, you know, secondary oil recovery in the 30s versus fracking today. Um, I would say are sort of two very analogous kinds of questions. And uh, um, if the fracking revolution turns out to be as great as its propagandists uh, tell us, um, I think the Bernanke policies will work. And we will, be, we will see a repeat of the 30s. You can, you can print money. Um, the stock market will keep going up. Commodity prices will stay cons constrained. And, um, all the, uh, all the sort of uh, Merkel austerity people will be proven uh, very, very wrong. Um, 
If, on the other hand, it turns out to be uh, uh, somewhat over-exaggerated, then I think we will find ourselves um, in simply the third bubble in three decades, which is at some point going to blow up, but not until that particular technological story is, uh, is proven, to be, uh, proven to be somewhat of an exaggeration. The, the, the worrisome fact I would, I would suggest with fracking is that oil prices are still above the uh, 2003 levels. And so um, from a simple economics perspective, I would say you look at uh, what is the price of something um, and technological improvement. Technology means you do more with less. And so when oil costs $100 a barrel versus 25, or natural gas is $5 versus $2 of BTU in the, in the 90s, um, it's very odd for people to be as ecstatic about that result. It's counterfactually a good thing. I'm in favor of it. If we didn't do it, it would be even worse. But, uh, but I do think we should be a little bit skeptical of that, and that's the, uh, that's the specific set of questions I would pursue. Thanks. Let, let me turn now to, to Mitch Julius. Uh, do you use history in that sort of way, looking for differences as much as for similarities? Obviously, the answer is you have to look at history because while it may not exactly repeat, patterns from history um, are very important to be cognizant of. And I'll give you a very visual example, slide 25. So it's obvious that uh, if you don't keep ahead of what's going on, uh, you know, you can have disastrous consequences. The, uh, so then the question is, what's your framework for history? I think the framework uh, issue was brought up in the Rise and Fall of Civilizations panel that Neil was on. And so if you could bring up slide 38, please, I'll give you a visual also of what I think uh, a framework for history might be as it informs today and the future. So, one view, particularly men have this issue when they try to solve problems at home, is you push in one direction and, you know, something is closing in on you and you think you've solved it because you pushed it away. Slide 39. And, uh, you know, as conventional language often points out, that what goes around comes around. So the world, in essence, is, uh, is complex. And you can think of complexity, and certainly history shows this, in terms of feedbacks, both uh, reinforcing feedbacks that result in nonlinear type of uh, positive growth or nonlinear destruction of wealth, and uh, what you call balancing or negative feedbacks, where you get this nice uh, attenuation of trends and things sort of level out. And it's sort of the equilibrium mode that neoclassical finance posits. So take a look at this visual, uh, slide 26. And this is from the book Origin of Wealth by um, Eric Beinhacker, who uh, posits right before uh, the uh, Lehman situation and the Great Recession that ensued, the idea that uh, neoclassical finance really required a new framework, and he calls it complexity economics. So this is very instructive visual because it seems to indicate that for a long time, nothing happened in terms of one measure of prosperity. And then uh, if you look at the, um, the bottom in terms of, um, of that uh, slide, and then all of a sudden during the uh, 1700s, things started to really take off. So then you, can you have to ask your question, if the world is marked by tipping points and feedbacks and nonlinearity, which is an interesting way of describing complexity, simple terms, things that we know about, um, what accounts for these patterns, overshoot, collapse, oscillation? So one explanation, for example, of this explosion in wealth could be simply what was uh, discussed by Jared Diamond. Um, diseases. We changed our framework on diseases. It was a germ approach. And as a result, the physical technologies were invented that allowed us to extend longevity. And as a result, if you live longer, you have the possibility of creating uh, more wealth because of that simple mortality issue. 
Secondly, on a, in terms of social technologies, the idea that women, for example, play a role in society, whether it's at home or in the workforce, started to gain currency. And if you look at the tremendous explosion of women participating in the economy post-World War II, you had an amazing expansion of the workforce, not likely to be replicated. There was a tipping point in social understanding of their role. And if you look at growth, and maybe hopefully growth leads to wealth creation, then it's a matter of technology, which you referred to, whether it's in fracking or software, so productivity of labor, and expansion of labor. So those are two issues. And then the question is, do their d dynamics result in very nice patterns that we do on spreadsheets, or are they sort of overshoot, collapse, oscillation patterns? Last thing that I'll talk about, turn it over, is slide 29. Here's a specific example, which we'll discuss in our panel. You brought up fracking, but we also will talk about, obviously, Europe. And in slide 29, what drives these different countries to literally paper over their ethnic and religious differences that have resulted in millions of people being killed over the centuries? And this is chronicled in your book, uh, War of the World. What motivates them to take these disparate cultures and economies, paper over their differences through the Euro mechanism, even though it's an imperfect structure, and, and stay together despite the cost. And as was pointed out in your panel, the cost of war, which is what this quote refers to by Helmut Kohl, the cost of war in their mindset, the historical presence in, in terms of the ghosts and the demons of the past, are still very, very present and drives a lot of their thinking and actions today. Thanks, Mitch. And th that, of course, leads many people in the audience to ask, yeah, but what does this do for my, my portfolio? <laughs> I always want to try and make that connection between the historical framework and investment action. And maybe there's no better person to ask than Ben Funnell. This is what you do, Ben. You, you ultimately make decisions about asset allocation and equities. Is there a connection from the Helmut Kohl quotation that Mitch just gave us and what you do for a living? If so, what is it? Thanks. As, as the guy from Europe, I think it would be remiss of me not to pick up on that. Um, I think there strongly is. I'll just pick up one example that has really surprised me um, over the last two or three years, um, which, which I think is a misunderstanding which springs from not necessarily understanding history. And, and it would be the German example. It's really surprised me how much people in the UK, probably the US also, have given airtime to the notion that Germany would abandon the, the Euro project uh, over the last three or four years. Um, it amazed me because, partly, I, I grew up in Germany. Um, so, and, I, and for a brief period, went to a German school. And what that gave me was an understanding of Germany's attitude to its own past, which I think is very relevant today. Um, if you look at the German history syllabus in schools, it is obsessed with national social socialism. If you go into a German bookshop, half of the books, not half, a lot of the books, are about the Nazis. The best-selling book in Germany last year, actually, was Soldaten, which is, as you know very well, the um, transcripts of German POWs um, captured in, in, in German um, uh, POW camps, and a, really a harrowing account of, of the atrocities that, that they committed. And that was a very big seller in Germany. The point of all this is to say that I think Germany is incredibly well aware and very frank about its own past. And as a result of that, the German um, national commitment to the euro is incredibly engaged and uh, all-encompassing, all I would say. So we can cross-check this. We, we can just look at the Handelsblatt uh, poll from two weeks ago, which um, suggested that 65% of Germans approve of the euro. So what does this mean in terms of you know, real live portfolios then? I mean, there is one very clear conclusion that I think you can come to if you believe that the euro will be held together, and it's this. 
for as long as the, uh, the system is together, we will have the reverse of the situation in the 2000s. In the 2000s, Spain had inappropriately low German interest rates, and as a result of that, real, real assets and wages inflated, as you would expect. Today, we have this, the reverse situation where Germany has Spanish interest rates. Um, inflation is much higher than, than, the, than the interest rate, and for the first time in a generation in Germany, you've got negative real bond yields. Um, there will be inflation, and you can see it already coming through wages. It may not be hyperinflation, but there will be inflation of real assets, in my view, as long as this system holds together. Um, and so it leads you to German real estate. There you are, your first investment tip from this panel, and I, <laughs> I can promise you more, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, another man who thinks a good deal about asset allocation is, is, is my good friend Dan Arbus. Uh, so Dan, I sometimes think you think history is, is bunk in Henry Ford's famous phrase. On the other hand, you spent a lot of, of your early career in Eastern Europe where history never goes away. What's your take on this big question of how history can help us um, invest? You know I don't think history is bunk because I'm your biggest fan, Neil. Um, I, look, I, I think that history is kind of the great heuristic, as Peter was referring to it before. We always think about history, even in the simplest of contexts, right? If you see a friend and he's got a bunch of kids, right away you're trying to figure out which kid looks like which parent. History is what we use to put current circumstances and events in some context to understand the world as it is. But I think what's most interesting about history is when it's made. That is, when things happen that we don't understand because they don't fit within our immediate historical context, or on the other hand, when things happen and the approaches that we take to the problems uh, as a historical matter don't seem to work any longer. So the making of history to me is much more interesting than the application of history to the problem in cases especially where it doesn't, it doesn't quite work. So can I ask about a specific example? And maybe it would help to look at slide 33 uh, while we do that. Uh, and that's the example of the, the depression. Uh, we, we've all just experienced uh, in the last five or more years the biggest financial and macroeconomic shock of our lives. And only very, very elderly people, uh, the sort who will live to be a 1,000 uh, regular attendees at the Milken Conference, have first-hand memories of the events of 1929 through the 1930s. Now, in this chart, I've taken three depressions uh, in the US equity market, uh, and the green line is our experience. Uh, the red line, or crimson line, is the Great Depression that you all have heard of or read about in the 1930s, and the blue line is the one you've mostly not thought much about, uh, but which, uh, which happened in the 1870s. Now, for me, as the crisis unfolded, beginning, in fact, in early 2007, the, the issue was always, would we reenact the early 1930s? And in fact, for the first phase of the crisis, we did. I mean, look how that green line tracks the red line right down until, in fact, the summer of 2009. So one explanation for the divergence that happens after that is that we learned the lessons of history. That Ben Bernanke, in particular, a student of the Great Depression, who by good fortune was running the Fed, did the right thing, did the opposite of what the Fed did in the 30s, and that's why we're not in the Great Depression. And that's always struck me as the classic illustration of how history matters. Learning from history, in fact, was what the Fed did. Is that the way that you thought about it? Did you see us somehow nearly reliving the Great Depression, but, but dodging the bullet by learning the right lesson? Certainly the risk was there, and we were all incredibly lucky that we had a chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank that was a student in deflation and a student in history. But this story that we're looking at here is not really over. If we unpack and use the historical framework for a moment and look at the responses to the crisis of various players, because Ben Bernanke, as we know, is not the only game in town, I'd like to show you a couple of slides that, that suggest that we're not through the crisis yet, that we are making mistakes in certain areas that could come back to change the shape of that green curve, uh, and uh, attention needs to be paid. So if you look, for example, at page 15, this is just the background context. Here is a, you know, a historically unusual circumstance 
where you see the employment drawdown in uh, the last recessions of the past 30 years, what you can see in this circumstance is that we have a much deeper labor employment drawdown this time and a much slower employment recovery than we had historically. The reason for that, I believe, is because, of course, we're in a balance sheet uh, recession. We're in a deleveraging cycle. And the problem that we're experiencing right now in the U.S. economy and to a large extent in the global economy is excesses of labor and excesses of productive capacity and a deficit in demand. So if you look at page 16, you start to see how the tools work that we usually apply to these kinds of circumstances. This is the, a slide taken from a recent presentation by uh, uh, one of the Fed governors, Janet Yellen, who's very influential. Um, so, some see her as a potential successor. And some who, Manaki. you know, many see her as a potential successor. Um, basically, when you have a demand deficit in the private sector, the, the government sector can play a very, very important role by substituting for that deficit of demand. And there's two ways in which the government sector can do that, fiscal policy and monetary policy. The slide that you showed before talked about monetary policy, and we'll come back to that in a moment and, and what its limits are. The point of this slide is to say, really very simple, common sense. And you know, Larry Summers and Brad DeLong did a big paper on this. It's been well quoted and well cited recently um, last year. The idea is really very simple. If you have a problem, you want to put money in people's pockets with fiscal policy. You want to cut taxes. You want to invest in infrastructure. You want to take actions at the fiscal level that will have a multiplier effect. The problem that we have right now is we got off to a good start with the stimulus, with the TARP, with the, th with the initiatives that were taken in the first part of 2009, where on your slide you got the deep drawdown. And that started to give you some tailwinds to the economy, but we basically stopped and we've been mired down for the past four years in this endless cycle debate about austerity versus expansion where it's very, very clear. You can um, impose fiscal contraction on an economy where you have to room in monetary policy to offset the effect. In other words, in ordinary times, interest rates are at a normal level. You can contract uh, your debt, deal with your fiscal problems, and offset the impact of that by reducing interest rates. But when interest rates are at the zero bound, you don't have any room for fiscal consolidation. And that's the main lesson that we're missing here, but the Europeans are missing by country mile. The ECB, as Ben will talk about you know, later, is falling way, way behind in this, in, in this respect. So what this shows you is that basically our lack of action on fiscal policy has caused fiscal policy to be a headwind in this recovery, whereas it's historically been a tailwind because it's been expansionary fiscal policy. So what have we done? If you flip to slide 17, we've relied exclusively on monetary policy. And we all know the story. We've had a massive balance sheet expansion by the Fed. Quantitative easing program involves the Fed buying uh, securities, driving yields down, and driving risk assets up. To a limited extent, it's actually worked very, very well. We've replaced about 12 trillion of the 19 trillion dollars of wealth lost in the United States during the global economic crisis. The vast majority of that, however, has been replaced equity wealth, about 10 trillion of that. We've only replaced about 2 trillion of lost housing wealth, leaving a hole of 5 trillion, which is impacting the vast majority of people. As Al Gore pointed out last night, in this recovery, 93% uh, of the wealth recovery has accrued to the top 1%. Right. So the recovery is leaving the vast majority of people behind, at least until home prices continue to appreciate and that asset recovers, which I believe we're very much on a track to doing. So the question then becomes, what other policy options are there that can be used where the limits of quantitative easing are being reached. I mean, you, you can only print and buy debt and accumulate debt for so long. So I wanted to introduce an idea for us to consider here, which I think would be interesting, that is really starting to percolate around the academic literature. And that's an idea, uh, if you flip, I think I have it on the next slide, yeah. Um, uh, if you flip to the next slide, 18, what this basically shows you is that despite the fact that you've had this massive balance sheet expansion through quantitative easing, 
the actual increase in money in circulation, the money supply, which is the thing that drives inflation and nominal GDP growth, has been absolutely anemic. So what's happened to all the money is it's on deposit at the Fed. It's not being on loaned into the economy and therefore not being put to productive uses. So QE is starting to reach its limit. And the question is, what else is there beyond that? The concept that I wanted to introduce here and put on the table for consideration because it's so new is something called monitor, uh, uh, um, um, overt. overt monetary finance which is basically helicopter money, and then I'll be quiet, because I want to hear what everybody thinks about this. But Peter's almost unable to contain himself. Yeah, no, so Peter's, well. Peter's going to get all over <laughs> this in a second. But this is why this isn't going to get violent. No, no, this is going to get good. But, but this is why I want to put the concept down, OK? The idea behind this was introduced as the ultimate deflation fighting mechanism by uh, none other than Milton Friedman back in 1948. Ben Bernanke started to talk about it in 2003 when he advised the Japanese who were trying to fight deflation to cut taxes. And this is really, when you think about it, an outrageous suggestion. Cut taxes and offset the decline in government revenues and, 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 and the deficit impacts of that by simply transferring, transferring capital directly from the BOJ to uh, the Ministry of Finance. So not issuing new debt, but just simply printing money, giving it to the government, allowing the government to cut taxes, allowing the government to make investments that would then have a multiplier effect in the economy. Now, the obvious objection to this is, well, now, wait a minute. If we just start printing up money now and we don't even have to collect taxes and, uh, uh, and we, we do this, we will lose control entirely of our ability to manage the economy uh, we will lose all discipline if we get in our heads that we can just print money and, and, you know, and give it out. And second, more importantly, it will eventually be extremely inflationary. The response to that, which I'll lay out, is I believe that you could do this kind of transfer, which would put money directly in the economy, basically fuse monetary and fiscal policy together in one policy mechanic without increasing the burden of debt, interest-bearing debt, you could do this by having the Fed maintain strict targets on uh, inflation and on nominal GDP growth so that it would stop doing that when it hits it as the Fed has articulated targets right now on unemployment, which, by the way, our problem right here is that we may hit the Fed's unemployment target thanks to the tailwinds that we're getting from, from energy and from, uh, from, from housing recovery but still not in any way be in an inflation situation that would allow for the Fed to begin to withdraw. So this is the ultimate nightmare for many people that I talk to, uh, the, the sort of coming together uh, of, of Keynesianism and monetarism uh, in such a way that the entire federal debt ends up on the balance sheet of the Fed uh, and, and helicopters uh, fly overhead with dollar bills. No, no, but no, no new debt would be created through this mechanism. But here's the, here's the, here's the problem. And then, I'll, and then I'll turn it over to Peter. You know, Milton Friedman had a very interesting uh, analogy about the overactive uh, central banker. For anybody who's been in a hotel, a new hotel room, what's a common phenomenon? You go into the hotel, you take a shower, and you don't know how exactly the dial works, right? So you turn it to get hot water, and you don't get an immediate feedback of hot water. You keep turning it and turning it and turning it, and then you get scalded, and then you turn it the other way, and you get cold, and then you figure it out. So that's, uh, all that stuff, it's terrific because Econ 101, you've now updated all my thinking, um, <laughs> which is terrific, but it's still unidirectional because it doesn't deal with the fact that there's... Oh, I didn't talk about withdrawal. The mechanism <laughs> in the academic work is simply that when economic activity begins to pick up, the Fed can absorb all this excess money out of the system by increasing reserve requirements and interest rates on reserves. Totally agree, but the issue is time delays in the system, data collection, and in macro situation, micro situations, I mean, you're talking about big ma macro balance sheets where you're gonna do all these policy levers, and supposedly if everybody is omniscient, it all works out. Um, but in micro situations, such as when you start up a company, you know, you have the humility uh, 
of knowing that these things don't work out perfectly. So all I would say is that if your view of history is that it's complex, instead of trying to predict what a policy action will do, uh, you, tr you try to prepare. And uh, one, of the w one of the ways to do that is to combine two great investment managers or philosophers from the 30s who had different views of the world. One is Will Rogers has said during the Depression, um, he was more interested in the return of his money than the return on his money. And the other great investor philosopher was Albert Einstein, who believed that the compounding of wealth was one of the most powerful forces in the universe. So the issue there is return of your money versus return on your money. And the interesting thing is that in a complex world where you can't predict, but you can prepare, because it's not unidirectional, you don't know whether all these policy levers are gonna work and you're gonna be like the man in the shower, the issue is how do you hang in there, stay alive long enough so you can, you can actually compound your wealth? And one of the easiest ways to do that is to constantly be able to take money off the table. And you're a bankruptcy guy, like I was, come from that background. So a lot of, these, a lot of times in these complex securities that have been designed by the, you know, the wonderful guys on Wall Street, that there is this, you know, if you look for the right places, the right place, uh, at the right time, at the right price, you do have this return of your money as well as a return on your money. You're combining Will Rogers with Albert Einstein. And that allows you to have staying power as well as earnings power and build wealth over time. And in that way, you don't have to predict. You can prepare. And I'm sure that's been your life in the micro world. Well, in every, in every context, one, one should uh, think about this. Although um, I, I, I would say that uh, let me let me try to sort of a whole bunch of different thoughts here. I'm going to try to combine a few of them real quickly. So I think it's possible that uh, we have neither deflation nor inflation. We just have low inflation. That seems to be the actual case. It's about running at about 2%. It's weirdly unbalanced. So there's some things that are inflating more quickly, like assets. Other things are slower. So maybe we need a new word like retroflation, where you know assets are going up and wages are going down or, or something like that. But, uh, but I think uh, if you... If you said Bernanke's job was to target an inflation rate, I think he gets an A or A plus. It's, you know, inflation expectations five years, five years forward are still very contained. And yet there is some sense that things are, something's not quite right. And, um, and what I, just to key off the Einstein, uh, um, uh, apocryphal Einstein quote that compound interest is the most it powerful force right. <laughs> uh, in the universe. Um, I wonder if we're actually in a time where there's a great challenge for Einsteinian investing in Einsteinian um, economics and Einsteinian finance. Because uh, if you wanted to say, if you want to ask the question, what is the single market that no one believes is correct? You know, you, we always, like we always, as investors, we always say this market's mispriced, that market's mispriced. But it's often useful to sort of take the other perspective. And so, you know, if, you know, gold is at $1,500, people are worried about inflation or, you know, um, you know, if, if uh, Greek bonds are yielding 15%, people are worried about Greece. So you can always ask the opposite question. What does the market tell you about the world? What does the market tell you about history? Instead of what does history tell you about the market? Flip the question around. So what is the single biggest market in the world that almost everybody thinks is wrong, even though people sort of believe that markets are generally efficient? I would submit the biggest market in the world that people think is completely wrong at this point is the real interest rate market. Mm. Um, real interest rates, 10-year real rates, minus 0.6%. And, um, and if, you, if you were to say, let's say that market is right, and what does that tell you? It tells you that Einsteinian economics is broken, right. that um, you cannot get returns anymore. Um, and, um, and this is sort of a problematic fact for all of us who are involved in trying to figure out ways to, uh, to invest money, but the, the, that your, your baseline expectation should be you're going to get minus 0.6% real. And if you get more than that, you should be ecstatic and happy. And if you're expecting 8 to 10% a year with zero volatility, um, you know, maybe there's another Madoff you can find somewhere. But, um, but, it's, um, but, but what the, if that market is correct, it's telling you uh, something is, is very broken. So I think the, there is this micro question of what should people do with the money that's very hard to answer. And so the, uh, and there was a the political version of this that I think was very interesting in the uh, early years of the Obama administration where 
Um, there was this desire to do a lot of uh, infrastructure spending and infrastructure investment. And uh, between the 08 campaign and the 09 stimulus bill, the infrastructure spending more or less got dropped out altogether. And uh, even though you, know, you, you look around the US, you say a lot of stuff's falling apart. We should be doing more of it. But there were no infrastructure projects that, could easily, that seemed to have a good um, ROI. They all cost too much. There was too much red tape. There was nothing you could actually do. And so I, I tend to think there's a lot of micro-regulatory regulation that is preventing us to get a good return on capital. And this is a very big difference from the 30s as well. So in the 1930s, it was 15 months to build the Empire State Building from start to finish. Uh, World Trade Center, 12 years and counting. Golden Gate Bridge in my backyard in San Francisco, uh, three and a half years in the 30s. At this point, the Pelosi Access uh, Road uh, is taking eight years to build, costing more in inflation-adjusted dollars than the original bridge cost in the 1930s. Um, and, so, um, and so I think the, um, there is this micro question of, um, have we outlawed um, the ability to effectively deploy capital into the real economy? And is that, um, is, is, is there something, is, is, the, uh, is the real rate telling us something about um, that we're sort of in a place where things are actually strangely very different from the 30s again? And that would be a problem for the kind of, of policies that you're talking about, Dan, if, if in fact these are structural problems that are explaining the relatively slow growth that we see in the developed world, no amount of stimulus, fiscal and or monetary, necessarily will will work. Uh, Adam well, Smith, well, look, if, I, if you just pursue yeah. that po point a bit further, because it, it seems to me that if you, again, think historically about when things like this have been tried, because it's been tried, there have been occasions uh, in which there has been uh, direct finance of governments by central banks before. It happened, mind you, mostly in wartime. Uh, in fact, it was the standard method of war finance uh, throughout uh, most of modern history, culminating in World War I and, and, and World War II. What, what you're really proposing, and it's also been proposed by Lord Turner, uh, the uh, outgoing uh, uh, head of the FSA in the UK, the Financial Services Authority, is essentially the, the same kind of policy, but in peacetime. So I just, can we call up uh, slide 36? Neil, can I just a interject a very quick response to that before you go forward? Look at the slide first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. I mean, I just wanted to make clear, I'm not advocating this. I'm just simply making the observation that the fiscal policy channel is blocked now. And Peter's added that the regulatory channel is blocked. And there's been a lot of talk at this conference about where Washington is falling down. That's a whole different topic. I'm just simply pointing out that if you wanted to bypass the ordinary fiscal policy channel, and provide some more stimulus to the economy, which needs it because it's still fighting deflationary forces, this is one mechanism that might be considered. It's just that history would le lead us to expect all of this ultimately to produce inflation because that tends to be the story of, of fiat money systems. In, in the past, once they became a, a simple channel for government finance, the, the end station was inflation, and that's why this bit this chart shows the, the huge discontinuity coinciding really with the advent of fiat money systems and the end of, 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 of monetary systems based on precious metal. Uh, I mean, there's another slide which may look horrible. I, I can't quite tell from this printout. 35 maybe goes to Peter's question. Uh, you know, you, you, there are periods when you get negative inflation adjusted returns. Uh, and my instinct is we're, we're going to head right into one of those and maybe already are in it. And that's traditionally how governments deal with excessively large public debts. Right. right? You're inflating it away. <clears throat> ben. Um, I, I think there is a, a, a point in history that's relevant to, to this, to this idea of uniting the, the monetary authority and the fiscal authority. Um, and that would be the period from sort of 43 to 51-ish here, um, up leading up to the Fed Treasury Accord. And at that point, you had the Treasury, sorry, the Fed, um, capping bond yields at two and a half and bills at three eighths. Um, and that's the only period, actually I've got a chart but I won't bother you with it, but it, it's the only time in the last 100 years when we've had um, investment grade corporate bonds yield less than they yield today. Um, we had debt stock, as, as you've written in the cash nexus and other places, the debt stock was very high. Um, and actually the you can see from this chart, which is still up, that 
negative real returns to bonds for three decades after that, but amazingly strong returns to equities. Um, the S&P went from 10 to 100 um, over that period. And I think that comes back to the point I think Peter was making earlier. It, we're not necessarily screwed as long as we've got some growth. But do we have the growth? Um, and so if you have, and so, you know, we were discussing this earlier, um, so I won't, I won't go over it. But I mean, if, if, um, if you have the drivers for growth, I think it's all right. What, what worries me is that I think what, this is a grand monetary experiment, or whatever, however you want to describe it. And it's not as though we can look to history to look for clues. We are making history. Um, and that's quite a scary, potentially scary place to be. And last point I'd make is the whole notion of the central bank balance sheet doubling and trebling over time and it being done simultaneously globally um, in a way alludes to, you could, you could say you know, no new debts created, sure if no new deposits are created and then the Fed has to perfectly time you know, the, the reserve requirements, etc. in the exit. Um, but it's a bit like a, a hedge fund which has got a net of zero um, but a gross of 1,000 or 10,000. You know, on the face of it, at first glance, it seems fine, but you just make one tiny mistake, um, and I think you've got all sorts of problems, and that clearly is what we don't know. So in, to Ben's point about the return on capital, what you mentioned, Peter, also, and whether macro policy can actually uh, have a micro impact in terms of how we use um, our... Uh, investment assets productively. Right now, um, well, I asked the question within our firm, uh, where's the real growth? Where is it? And then if you look at history and what's going on now, you look at labor force expansion in the United States. We've already said that there was a historical growth period from women participating. And now um, uh, labor participation for demographic reasons and other reasons because of incentive structures um, that labor force participation is declined. Okay, so if you look at growth, which again doesn't necessarily lead to wealth creation, you have lower labor growth in the developed nations. You have labor growth in, um, in the EM markets. Okay, so that's one thing. Now technology, this is your area, but the question is pushing the limits of technology. How much does technology and the productivity of labor and capital really add to growth? Is it a large number? Is it discontinuous in terms of history? Or is it sort of a slogging along 1% kind of thing? I mean, we all feel that we've lived through a miraculous time of relative peace and technological innovation. But really, what does it add in well, terms of the right. uh, one last right. thing? And then, so then the question is, OK, those traditional levers on a macro basis and what environment that gives guys like us. Because certainly, if we have negative real returns, pension funds, for example, that's a big issue. You know, I mean, it used to be 15%, you know, but now the 8% is the, is the new 15%. And now, if it's something close to what New York City, for example, re reported earning over the last fiscal year, there's a real issue there. And my parents were teachers in that school system, and they depended on their pension. So the issue comes, um, you know, the capital stocks in the developed nations seem to be significant, and China certainly has been using investment-led growth. So how much more output are you going to get from that? Now the question is your structural question. It's the redeployment and selection through market mechanisms or policy initiatives to try to target those leverage points where capital can produce more opportunities and more oomph. That really is the policy challenge as opposed to necessarily all these larger macro uh, policies that maybe create a context of stability but don't necessarily lead to growth. Finding those leverage points is very important. So, so Peter, I mean, you, you're on, on record as being one of the few pessimists in, in the Bay Area on the question of uh, technological innovation and, and growth. And, and the big difference, I think you made this point earlier, but it's worth re reiterating after Ben's remark, the big difference between coming out of the Great Depression and coming out of our slight depression 
is that coming out of the Great Depression, there was a whole lot of technological innovation that had been happening in the 30s that you could then roll out in the context of a, a very dynamic uh, demography and a very low regulatory world. The only thing that was really heavily regulated in that period was, of course, finance, so that there was financial repression uh, in the form of capped interest rates and so forth. Our situation looks very different indeed, uh, in that we haven't really had, in your view, so much in the way of a technological uh, boom before uh, the end of the crisis. And we're not going to be imposing interest rate controls of the sort that were characterized in the 1940s and 50s, at least. I don't think so. Peter? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a mistake to say there's no technological innovation, obviously, since we, we have had continued in innovation in the computer information technology sector over the last uh, 30, 40 years. But I think outside of that, we have um, has seen quite a bit of a slowdown in the last four decades. Uh, you know, there are about one third as many drugs being approved by the FDA today as were uh, per year as were being approved 20 years ago. Um, you know, the green revolution in agriculture has failed and is no longer increasing crop yields. And so you have to understand the so-called green revolution in the Arab world as um, not just a happy byproduct of the information age, but also as an unhappy uh, byproduct of desperate people who became more hungry than scared, um, and so, so, so a form of technological failure in agriculture. Um, and so I think you know, so there's sort of a lot of different uh, verticals like this that one, um, one, can, uh, one can go through. Um, it, is, it is my view that uh, technology, in the very long run, is the critical gating factor for at least the developed world. I think the developing nations, maybe they can just copy, steal, appropriate technologies and, um, and catch up. And so the, you know, the China story is sort of a very different question. But I think for the US, Western Europe, Japan, the developed nations of the world, for um, people here to have dramatically better lives in 20, 30 years, which is what you know, 3 and 4% compounding over that time means on a GDP basis, uh, requires um, some, some really different technologies to, uh, to come about and to, and to happen. So I think that's the, that's the critical question on a, on a scale of centuries. If you go back to Thomas Malthus in 1798, um, you know, in many ways he had been right for centuries before then. There had been stagnation. You know, your periods of inflation correspond with periods of population growth. And, you know, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and then he was wrong spectacularly for the next 170 years where you had a lot of population growth and even faster technological progress. And so per capita, living standards went up dramatically in the world from 1800 to 1970, among the most developed nations. Um, and, uh, and the question is, does this continue? If it does not continue, you end up with this uh, sort of much more Malthusian situation that can, that can, uh, that can uh, reemerge. I think, um, now I think it's a long run. And th there are other things that in the short run make uh, more of a difference. So I think one, one other thing we have not, we've touched on but not talked about too much is, uh, is demographics, um, which is very different today from other points in the past. And, uh, and so um, there's, uh, Bob Gordon, an economist at, uh, I, think North, I believe, Northwestern, yeah. has uh, written this very interesting paper where if you assume technological progress is happening at the same rate as it always has, and it was leading to, say, 2% GDP growth um, in the US over the last uh, few decades, um, you're going to have a demographic change. Um, you know, no more um, tailwinds from women entering the workforce, but headwinds from people retiring, the ratio of um, retired to working people uh, going up. And, uh, and you basically get the demographics alone lower the growth from 2 to 0.8%, even if technology stays all the same. So on a 10, 15 year horizon, demographics may be as important a variable. It's not only Malthus. And we know for certain what the demographics are going to be 20 years out. You know, you can, you can just look at who's Peter alive. Peter Drucker said demographics is destiny, right? But, but 100 years from now, not so sure, but 20 years from now, we can say a lot. What's really fascinating is, is to realize that many of these issues we're discussing were in the minds of people in the late 18th century, not, not only Malthus. But Adam Smith has this great concept of the stationary state. Uh, he talks about China in the late 18th century as an opulent, rich country that stopped growing. And, and he says it stopped growing because their laws and institutions are no longer compatible with growth. Well, I, I've been asking myself for some time, and it's the theme of a book that's just come out in June, The Great Degeneration, have we now reached the stationary state? Not just for demographic reasons, but because of regulatory uh, restraints, because we've reached the limits of what Keynes and Friedman 
actually taught us? Are we going to find ourselves in some version of the Japanese predicament? Now, I'm glad to see that Dan is shaking his head as I speak. I always like disagreement on panels. Dan, wh why are we not in the stationary state? I don't think we're in the stationary state. I've read The Great Degeneration in, in, in a draft form, and I won't, I won't get into the debate with you line by line, but my feeling is that uh, notwithstanding some of the broad global trends, which I do believe that, that we may actually place more credence in than is warranted, for example, the China story, we can be long-term bulls on the potential of China, but they have a massive, massive challenge <coughs> ahead of them in rebalancing their economy, which is going to keep a lid on what we can expect China to contribute to the global economy in coming years. The United States continues to have the most dynamic economic model in the history of the world, I believe. If you just look at what's going on that's positive in the US economy today, we have mind-boggling innovation in the energy industry, which, as everybody in this room is by now aware, is a complete game changer at multiple levels and will ultimately end up changing the economics of energy globally. We have, notwithstanding the total dysfunctionality of our government in Washington, we have a very healthy recovery underway in the basic dynamics of the housing market. We have a number of factors that are going to continue to propel the United States, I believe, into a leading position. Europe has a lot of potential as well, but it's got this headline political problem that it's, it needs to solve before it even has as many tools as we have. It doesn't have a, a, a coherent central bank now because the central bank serves at the, uh, you know, at, at the pleasure of Germany, who is its largest patron. And that's not going to change until you get some further political integration in Europe. So I, I believe that while the demographics, and I've spent you know, most of my 30-year career focused on the emerging markets, while the demographic realities of the entry into the global consumer economy of the 3.5 billion people that formerly lived under the state planning economies in, 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 in the world, while those demographic realities are excellent and are going to provide support for growth in the world for a long time to come, it's not going to be linear, and it's not going to be as immediate as a lot of people think. I don't want people looking at negative real returns for too long, so can we look at slide 32 uh, as it goes uh, directly to some of the things that we've just begun talking about? We've, we've got seven uh, uh, minutes left. I want to use 30 seconds to contemplate world history uh, since 1500. Uh, this is really all you need to know. Uh, these are ratios of per capita GDP, US to China, UK to India, US to Brazil. Uh, and you can see just the uh, extraordinary uh, uh, quality of the turnaround that's happened in our lifetimes. Because most of history from 1500 to 1978 was a great divergence as the West got much richer than everybody else. And everything that's happened since the late 1970s is a great reconvergence. Uh, we've gone from a situation in which the average American was 22 times richer than the average Chinese to one in which uh, we're now down to five to one. Uh, and if the projections of the OECD right are right, we will below, be below two to one by the time we get to the middle of this century. So this is probably the single biggest historical change uh, uh, of our time, and, and we're rather privileged to be living through this great reconvergence. Can we use the last five or six minutes to ask what worries us the most. In China, they worry the most about the social and political consequences of growth. The success story has produced all kinds of headaches. You alluded to them there, environmental, the problem of inequality, and so forth. People in China today, at the very highest level in the leadership, are reading Tocqueville's old regime and the revolution. That's become required reading for the Standing Committee of the Politburo ever since Vice Premier Wang Qishan started to recommend it. So that's what worries them. What worries you? Let me start with you, Dan. What's, what's your big worry about this, this world that we're describing? Well, actually, you know, since I've been talking about big ideas for the past hour, what worries me is really rather something much more pedestrian, which is the phenomenon that affects us as investors, which is the phenomenon that Al Gore was talking about uh, last night, where he said, we're long short, and we're short long in the world. That, th the suggestion is that the people who are allocating capital 
have a certain return requirement over a certain return horizon, but the capital is being allocated to investors who have much shorter duration. So the biggest problem that I think about is the mismatch between the duration, the length of time, and the processes, as Al Gore referred to them, involved in creating and really realizing value, particularly in a low return, low velocity environment, and the terms that are fixed to the capital that are, you know, that are allocated to the people who have to make first line investment decisions. Ben, what's your big worry? I know inequality is one of the things that is on your mind and it kind of relates to, to Dan's point. No, it absolutely does. <clears throat> and I, I speak as someone whose funds have daily liquidity, so exactly to your point. This chart, I think, is very interesting because, well, it speaks to the great convergence of wealth around the world. What we also see is a great divergence of wealth within the wealthy part of the world. And I think if I look at, if we try and look at this crisis, and the title of this panel is something about the post-crisis world, which is, we've discussed is, is a highly contestable notion. Um, I think it comes down partly to um, the genesis of the crisis was income inequality. Um, and I've got all sorts of charts here, but we can uh, send them around later maybe. But the, but the bottom line is, you know, at, if you couldn't earn it, you could borrow it. And that was the case throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And the result of that was um, a disproportionate debt load uh, on the bottom two income quintiles. And if we look, and this is true in the UK, the US, it's true in China, it's in their five-year plan um, to try and address what is probably the world's worst Gini coefficient. Um, and I think until we start to address that, we will have, for example, in the US, this, this polarization politically which can lead which can make it very hard um, to agree a way forward. Mitch, do you worry about that inequality issue or is there something even more scary? Look, you're, you're writing The Great Degeneration, right? I mean, that's coming out, but you also wrote about civilization, the six killer apps, which really is a, one of the examples of a wealth creation formula. And I, I started out by saying, if the world's complex, you can't be totally predictive. You have to be prepared, right? And I talk about return of money as well as return on money. It's the best way to sort of, some simple stupid way to sort of manage risk. Keep taking money off the table and, and then, you know, have some optionality for a good returns, especially in a challenged world like this. And if you stay in the game long enough, things get served up to you. Now, what is that? That's on the macro, le micro level because, look, you can't be always worried if you're in the investment business. You gotta have a sort of optimistic, it can't be Panglossian, it has to be realistic. So what I would like to just say in closing is that when I look at the United States, and I agree, as a balance sheet issue, the United States on the left side of the balance sheet is pretty well situated. On the right side of the balance sheet, we have entitlement issues, et cetera, et cetera. But look at what is going on in the next 20 years. The baby boomers who have not served this country, like in war, except the Vietnam War and a few other more limited kinds of engagements, have had unfettered ability, for all the reasons we talked about, to accumulate tremendous wealth during this time. And they're going to turn it over because they're at the point in time where they're thinking about legacy issues. So for example, keep your eye on what's gonna happen in New York City. They are going to try to create what you have up in Palo Alto, right? And this is Bloomberg's vision as he exits the mail team. He has combined the uh, abilities of Cornell with the Technion on Roosevelt Island to, to create a world innovation center to make the complexity of New York City beyond financials. That business cluster approach to get a leverage point in discontinuous wealth creation and lots of guys are going to turn over their money for that project. You already had 330 million from Chuck Sweeney, 180 million from Jacobs. That's incredible. So that, to me, is what is a major positive higher education, medical research, business cluster creation. You have the potential for being somewhat optimistic. We're in danger of ending on a high note, Peter. <laughs> well, well I, help I, me out. I, you know, I, 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 I do think. Uh, I do think uh, uh, um, your point that, uh, that uh, as investors, we can't structurally, you know, you, you know, if the world's gonna blow up, 
there's just going to be there going to be no investors left, no money left. So that's not a scenario you can really fundamentally invest in, like the nuclear war scenario or something like that, or you know all these sort of apocalyptic scenarios. Um, you you um, they may maybe they happen, but they're not really useful to think about beyond a certain point. Um, and this is again a divergence between financial actors and sort of looking at this from a historical perspective that I think is interesting. Uh, and so, you know, one, one has to assume that uh, for the most part, things muddle through in one way or another. And then uh, there are questions, you know, how does one navigate uh, through this? Uh, I, I find myself most worried about the disappearance of the future as an animating idea for our civilization, of how, you know, the future will be better. When 80% of the people in this country think the next generation will be less well off than the current generation, um, you know, then at some point people give up. You no longer try to work hard for a better future, and instead you substitute leisure for work. And this is, you know, what's happened in Europe, and that's what's at risk of happening in, in the U.S. And I think the idea of a better future that motivates uh, and drives people onwards um, is an incredibly important idea. And uh, and to sort of agree with uh, with uh, one of Dan's points, uh, I, the, the way I the way I try to think about it is. Uh, is long time horizon investments because uh, those are those are incredibly out of fashion. Anything that takes more than a decade to build is not getting invested in, um, and you know even more than two years, even in venture capital. You know, so you say venture capital is the area which is you know makes the most claims towards this, but even there, you know, people want to have things that are measurable where you can see traction within a year, eighteen months, two years. Um, potential liquidity as soon as possible, and uh, and I think this, this you know we're going to be alive for more than two to three years, so we should be thinking about how what can we do that will actually make sense over 20, 30 years, and that's a very valuable question to think but, about in all these contexts. Let, let's be long, long. Keynes said that in the long run we're all dead, but not at the Milken Global Conference. In the short run, you're all going to have lunch. I'd like to invite you to join me in thanking our brilliant panelists for this great discussion.